Howdy folks, this is Miss Sinclair for Miss Sinclair's History. Today, we are continuing on with period three for AP US history. Period three looks at the revolutionary time period between 1754 and 1800. Today, we are talking about topic 3.3, taxation without representation. Remember, you can watch a PowerPoint that goes along with this lecture on YouTube. This is the exact same content that my students would receive in my classroom. Or if you just wanna listen, you can listen to this as a podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. My goal here is to provide a resource for students, teachers, or anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about US history. So let's get to it. So what were some of the effects of the French and Indian War? There is going to be a couple significant changes that will result from that war. Think if you can remember what were those. Now, if you are struggling right now, if you are thinking, I have no idea, you might need to review a little bit more. If something that we talked about yesterday or you learned in class two days ago isn't coming to mind, then you have the classic situation of information coming through your ears and out your pencil without sticking in your brain. Students oftentimes think that going to class is enough to learn the information. Going to class is enough to be introduced to the information. If you really want to learn it, though, and remember it for the AP test in May, I recommend you do a little bit of studying outside of class. Make flashcards, read over your notes, read the textbook, get an AP review book. It's going to require some out of class review, though. Two big changes were, of course, the loss of all French territory in North America and the creation of the Proclamation of 1763, which keeps British colonists from migrating west of the Appalachian Mountains. So today we are talking about topic 3.3, taxation without representation. You will be able to explain how British colonial policies regarding North America led to the Revolutionary War. All right, let's get to it. Everyone is always excited to learn about the revolution. Now, you already may know information about the Revolutionary War. You might be familiar with it from popular media, from TV shows or movies or musicals. Let's get into a little bit more depth, however. After the French and Indian War, also known as the Seven Years' War, there is a huge war debt. Britain had really extended itself during the war to fund all of these overseas excursions. Remember, the Seven Years' War was part of a much wider European war that included fighting in continental Europe and the Caribbean and Asia. So all of this is very expensive. It's expensive to have wars on other continents. Therefore, the British policy of letting the Americans do what they want, not worrying too much about the navigation acts is not going to work. This is going to be the end of salutary neglect, right? We need a change in British policy. So we need more revenue. The UK is annoyed with the lack of colonial help during the war. And at this point, the British were starting to get more involved in Asia, particularly with the British East India Company's actions in India, and they need revenue to support those endeavors. So we begin with the Stamp Act crisis. The Stamp Act is one of many acts, um, many laws implemented by the British Crown to try and raise money. So let's go through a few of them. First is the Sugar Act in 1764. If you remember way back in 1733, the British Parliament passed a law known as the Molasses Act, which essentially said, um, 
American colonies can't import molasses from the Caribbean, from French or Dutch Caribbean islands. But no one really enforced this, right? They still got their molasses and still made it into rum. Now, the Sugar Act is that same idea. You can only buy sugar from British Caribbean colonies and it will be enforced, right? Um, not all agreed. Um, some thought it violated the British constitution. A big one that is less of a big deal nowadays, but is much more of a big deal back then is the quartering act 1765. One challenge for any military is the fact that you need to figure out, um, where your soldiers are gonna stay, right? If you are a military historian, you look at strategy and logistics. And generally the rule of thumb is wars are won by logistics, not strategy. You can have the most amazing plan where you sneak up on the enemy on their flank and outmaneuver them, blah, 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 blah. The most perfect plan in the world doesn't matter if your soldiers haven't had enough food for three months, if they haven't had a dry roof over their head, if they haven't had the, enough supplies, are disgruntled from living conditions, etc. So the British crown sought to offset the cost and planning necessary to house and feed their soldiers by forcing American colonists to get essentially a British soldier roommate. The British military gets to stay at your house and you have to feed them. Now, part of you might think, well, you know, it's not ideal, but it's not the worst thing in the world. But imagine, imagine if, um, you know, soldiers from the East Coast came to your hometown. I live in the West. Soldier from, soldiers from another part of the country came to your town and you had to put them up in your house. You had to feed them. They were around your teenage daughters all the time. You couldn't just like walk around your house in your underwear if there's five soldiers there, right? It feels like the government is literally in your home and watching you. And you have to remember that houses in the 18th century are significantly smaller than what we experience now. So it's not like the soldiers got their own room, right? There might be one room for the entire house, right? And you are sleeping in the same room as your children, as the kitchen. And now as this random man who will be eating your food and offering his suggestions about your cooking and blah, 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 blah. Right, you can see how this would really not be very appealing to have to house random soldiers for who knows how long. Excuse me, but I'm a citizen too, right? I'm a British citizen. In London, they don't have to do this. What the heck? Then in 1765, you have the Stamp Act, which is a tax on all paper products. You need to buy cards. You need to send a letter. You need a birth certificate or a death certificate. You need a receipt. You have to pay a tax on every single piece of paper. So in response to this, you will see the Stamp Act Congress. The American colonies will get their act together. They will um, sign... Um, they're going to call the Virginia Re resolutions and it will essentially result in a boycott, right? They're going to argue that only colonial legislatures can tax internally. So sure, the Sugar Act might be legal because that is about importing food from other places, but within the colonies themselves, Britain can't tax that, only colonial legislatures Remember, they're already thinking of themselves as independent states. And by state, I mean like country, right? They have their own functioning governments. No other British colonial system is going to have as much of this, right? They're not worried about this in India or in Jamaica. 
because in no other place were independent representative governments set up so quickly and let, left to develop for so long. So representatives from the different colonies meet up for the Stamp Act Congress, and they decide they will boycott all British goods. Homemade things are the patriotic thing to do. So the, um, this decision to boycott British goods, it will have a significant impact on the British economy. A third of all sales came from Americans. And the Sons of Liberty, who we'll talk about more, will enforce the boycott, make sure that no one is buying any British goods. So let's talk about them a little bit. The Sons of Liberty are a very interesting group because we as Americans tend to look at their actions and think like, yeah, like those guys showed them. We tend to think of the Sons of Liberty as a, like a group of rowdy pranksters, right? They're getting in costumes, they're dumping British goods overboard, they're spray painting signs, like they're showing who's boss. Um, we tend to think of them as patriotic, as heroes. Well, there's another interpretation of their actions, which is one much more of terrorism, right? That they were a terrorist group um, attacking and scaring and bullying people into doing what they want. So Samuel Adams is going to be the leader of the Sons of Liberty. Oh, um, another important name in that is Paul Revere. Um, most Americans know Sam Adams from the beer named after him more than his revolutionary actions. But the Sons of Liberty is a pro-independence group of men whose participation in the revolutionary movement over time will be one, um, how do I wanna say this? They always take action. So for example, they will tar and feather the people who sell the stamps, who sell the taxes. Now, I don't know about you, but when growing up, when I thought of tarring and feathering, I thought of like, I don't know, you get like honey on you and then someone hits you with uh, a feather pillow. And so it's annoying, right? Ugh, you're sticky and there's feathers on you, but no harm, no foul. No, what actually happens when you are tarred and feathered, first of all, you are captured. Imagine if a gang of grown men grab you, beat you, tie you down, then they pour tar on you. What's tar? Well, think of the hot black goo that they pour on the roads to um, seal up the cracks. That's tar, right? Molten tar. So this is hot. This is not honey going on your skin. This is a hot liquid that is, will burn your skin as it comes in contact with it. And when it does come off, eventually you have to use oils right nowadays, you might use like turpentine. Um, don't know what they used back then, but your skin's coming off with it too. So they cover you in tar, then they cover you in feathers. So it, it's humiliation as well as a, you know, assault because for days, weeks, you're still going to be unable to get the last of the black tar off. You're still going to be finding feathers everywhere. And um, if you, you fight back, they're just going to beat you, right? What else did they do? They burned down a governor's house, right? Arson, his children were in there. His servants were in there. Um, it is a radical political organization. Right, um, they're not the only ones though, right? Even though they might be burning custom houses, they might be inciting um, riots. Other people across the colonies will also desire, start to talk about independence. Now, independence is not a for sure thing. 
yet. It's still a very radical idea. Like when you occasionally hear people in Texas or California being like, I'm going to secede and we're going to form our own Baja California or Texas is going to be independent. You hear those voices every once in a while, but you're just like, okay, sure, whatever. You know, that's not the mainstream. That's where we're at right now in American history. There's people advocating for colonial independence, but they're not mainstream, right? Um, we see that um, in South, in sorry, North Carolina in 1764, you have a group of men called the Regulators who threatened to rebel and refuse to pay taxes. So these sort of radical political groups are popping up. You start to have committees of correspondence, which are sort of committees, groups within each colony, and they're writing letters back and forth, and they're talking about the boycott. They're essentially organizing their frustration against the British. So like I said, the Sons of Liberty and Samuel Adams are often viewed as folk heroes, but their actions are often more like that of terrorists, arson, assault, you know, they would hang a noose outside your house. What if you woke up in the morning and you saw a noose outside your house with a sign with your dad's name on it, right? Or you saw a, um, a fake body, right? Like a, um, a body being burned at effigy and it's dressed up to look like you. That's not something to be like, all right, but let me explain to you why independence is the best choice. That's trying to scare you into obedience. So are they folk heroes or are they terrorists? How do they serve an example as an example of different interpretations of history? And how should we view them uh, a couple centuries later? The British, of course, don't take all of this lying down. In 1766, they passed the Declaratory Act which says um, Britain will repeal the Stamp Act. The um, British merchants were like, we're losing money here, guys. Like this tax is not worth it. So the Declaratory Act on one hand repeals the Stamp Act. On the other hand, it says very clearly, parliament is supreme. Parliament is in charge. We have the power to tax. We can make laws. If we decide that on Wednesdays we wear pink, that is the law and you will obey. This is not really what the colonists want to hear though. So when we get to the Townsend crisis in 1767, you'll see that things are just ex uh, escalating. So it begins the Townsend Acts in 1767. This is once again, an external tax, not an internal one on things you um, import, right? Glass, lead, tea. Benjamin Franklin makes the comment that you can really tax anything external without upsetting the colonists. Well, uh, it turns out Franklin is wrong. Uh, additional external taxes do upset us. Franklin sends a poem urging um, colonists to respect their mother country. And the revenue raised by these taxes would be used to pay royal governors and judges. So men who lived and operated and worked for the British crown in the American colonies. The colonial reaction is what you expect. Increase of smuggling, right? I'm not going to pay that tax. I'm going to buy it illegally. The boycott comes back again. They're going to call it the Non-Importation Act. And they thought it would really be successful. I mean, with the Stamp Act, it worked. They said, we're not going to buy, and Parliament backed down. Most people were still making their own goods. The Massachusetts General Court, which if you remember, the Massachusetts General Court is their government, is their colonial legislature, is going to pass around a letter known as the circular letter, right? Samuel Adams is from Massachusetts. He's from Boston. He is calling for a complete revolution. He's arguing that the Townsend Acts are unconstitutional. Well, what constitution are we talking about, right? The complaint is, um, in the circular letter, is that, American colonists 
have no representative representative in parliament and frankly we don't want representation parliament violated our natural rights which gets around the problem of parliament being supreme and colonies can only be taxed with their consent right the only people who may take away um who may tax colonists are other colonists essentially therefore colonists are justified in violent reactions this letter is sent not to great britain but to the other colonies from massachusetts to the other colonies but of course parliament gets a copy of it they respond with their own letter the hillsborough repeal letter um <laughs> which um, essentially says, hey, take it back. The general court's reaction to that is drop dead, <laughs> right? Um, if you look at the vote, it's 92 to 17, right? 92 uh, um, representatives in the general court said, screw you, uh, parliament. Um, we stand by what we said. Uh, in the 17 who voted to repeal the letter um, will end up being killed. Um, so what does parliament do? It shuts down the general court, right? So it shuts down the Massachusetts gover uh, government. Imagine if Washington, D.C., I, I think about all of the um, state capitals right now, and state legislatures are always saying something that makes people in Washington, D.C. mad, whether it's Florida or Texas or California or New York, right? Imagine if California sends a letter around to the other US states saying, Washington DC sucks, we should do X, Y, and Z instead. And Washington's response is take it back. Like say, take the letter back, repeal the letter. And California said, no, we're not gonna do it. And so they shut down California's government, right? Oh my gosh, like that's a huge step. And so when parliament closes down the general court, um, People in Boston are pissed off. A mob attacks the customs officials, anyone who works for the British government who is still in the Boston area is under attack. Therefore, British soldiers, troops go and start occupying Boston in 1768, right? General Thomas Gage comes in with four, um, I don't know what's the word I want, regiments of troops. And they're looking specifically for Sam Adams and Paul Revere. Thank you very much. So tensions are increasing here. The government's been shut down. Troops are occupying your town. People are feeling threatened. This is a bad idea. Not every American colonist is in agreement with Sam Adams, right? John Dickinson is going to be our classic representative of the colonial conservative. He will write his letters from a Pennsylvania farmer. He's going to say, um, Dickinson will start writing in 1767. And he's going to say, look, Parliament, you are supreme, right? You're the boss of us. You are the, uh, you make the laws. We get it. You hold all the cards. You have all the power. However, you have not been treating us very well, right? If parliament is mother and father, we are children and we have been mistreated. You are meant to love us and care for us, to provide us with a warm bed and enough food and fair discipline for um, crimes essentially, right? Have you ever done something where you felt like you were punished way more than um, what you did warranted? I just stole one cookie. Why am I grounded for a week? Um, Dickinson is saying, look, we're kids in this scenario. You're the parents, you hold all the power, but you've been overstepping. Parliament has never done this before to raise revenue. You, um, you're the boss, but like maybe treat us with a little bit more dignity. And he's gonna write a series of these letters. Then you have the Boston Massacre. Oh, this is a big event. Um, and the image associated with it is 
one you should recognize. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, at some point, pull up Google, type in Boston massacre, um, and you will see the image that I have included on my PowerPoint. It's a print from Paul Revere showing a line of British soldiers aiming their weapons and shooting Boston colonists, right? Um, in the background, you see, um, the classic outline of, um, Boston skyline and through the smoke, you see broken bodies, um, a man bleeding from his head, someone else being dragged away, just dead bodies and chaos everywhere. All right. This is an image I'm actually very familiar with. Um, my grandmother had a copy of one of these prints and it uh, was hanging in her house throughout all of my childhood. So the Boston massacre, March 5th, 1770. It's a snowball fight that leads to shots being fired. Five colonists are killed. Whoa, right? The British are really overreacting here. You have a group of colonists who are frustrated, throwing some snowballs at soldiers and they respond by firing their guns. Are you kidding me? Like, that's insane. That's massacre, right? That's murder. That's also not really what happened. This image, this classic image of the Boston Massacre is a great example of propaganda from the Sons of Liberty. In the image, you see the leader of the British soldiers standing behind them, arm outstretched, sword in hand, looking all for all the world like he's saying fire. Here's what actually happens. You have a small group of soldiers and a huge crowd of Bostonians. And the Bostonians aren't throwing little snowballs. They're throwing snowballs packed with rocks. And so if you got hit with one of those in the head, you're bleeding, right? They're not like tossing these softly. They are pitching them at the soldiers. The leader of the British soldiers was standing in front of his men between the colonists and his soldiers, arms outstretched in both directions saying, stop, stop. We like everyone stay calm. Like we don't want to hurt you colonists. Please just disperse. Just leave, leave us. We're doing our job. And someone gets nervous. A gunshot is heard. It's not exactly clear from where, who pulls the first shot. But as soon as you hear a gunshot, the soldiers all start shooting. If this was a plan to attack Bostonians, why would the leader of the soldiers be standing in front of the guns? This is what John Adams argues in front of the court. John Adams, cousin to Samuel Adams, our second president, our first vice president, a man who is going to be instrumental in passing the Declaration of Independence. He will ultimately be victorious in his defense of these men. So how could the Sons of Liberty use an event like the Boston Massacre as propaganda to increase support for the revolution? Well, the story I told you wouldn't necessarily be known to people outside of Boston who did not hear or read about John Adams' defense. If you're in New York or you're in South Carolina and you just get a copy of that image with a short description, you are going to grow angry and scared that the British have it out for you. So is war inevitable at this point? I always, you know, can't turn back now, like we're just, we're headed towards war? No. Three years passes without anything happening. Samuel Adams tries to keep the pot boiling. He's publishing pamphlets. He's saying, you have rights that come from nature and God. No one can take those from you without your consent. If they do, revolution is the only answer. This is the first time Amer and Americans use this word of revolution. 
And this is enlightenment philosophy straight from John Locke, right? No one would have talked like this before. This idea of a social contract did not exist before the enlightenment. The colonies are looking for an argument. And it's tricky, right? Because if you are John Dickinson in Pennsylvania, you have kind of a problem. Sure, parliament is supreme, but you also think they can't tax us. So we need a solution. Samuel Adams' response to this is, our rights don't come from parliament, our rights come from God. Parliament is violating our natural rights. And in sort of the 10 years since the Seven Years' War ends to sort of 1773, the dialogue around rights has changed. This idea of natural rights that come from God will be much more common. So without question, colonists felt a sense of humiliation from their treatment by the British they realized that they are not being treated like Englishmen in London. And so they changed their rhetoric from the rights of Englishmen to natural rights. And without France on your doorstep, right, without an enemy that you need the large British Navy to protect you from, they feel a lot more confident. Which means that in 1773, with the passage of the Stamp Act, the Sons of Liberty are added again. The Stamp Act is a three cent tax on tea. Sorry, did I say Stamp Act? The Tea Act. The Tea Act is a three cent tax on tea designed specifically to help the British East India Company, which had mismanaged its money and was going bankrupt over in India. This is a bailout. The Parliament's trying to give the British East India Company a bailout and they're going to tax the American colonists to pay for it. So the Sons of Liberty say, I don't think so. They dress up like Native Americans and dump 3,000 chests of tea into Boston Harbor. It's the equivalent of about $4 million worth of goods today. Great Britain and Parliament is getting very, very frustrated with the way these Americans keep acting, especially these Bostonians. Come on. And so you have what become known as the Intolerable Acts. They're actually a combination of the Coercive Acts and the Quebec Acts. So Boston Harbor is closed until the tea is paid for. Um, Instead of a local city government, they are now under martial law, which means military law under General Thomas Gage. No more general court, no more town meetings. Essentially, Massachusetts has lost all rights to govern themselves. Now, this is only in Massachusetts, but it worries the other colonies. The Quebec Act expands the province of Quebec into Ohio. It has something to do with a Catholic bishop. The main thing is parliament, colonists thought parliament was trying to make them Catholic. It's not a huge event on the road to revolution, but it does serve to just annoy the colonists more. So we are headed to the first Continental Congress. The first Continental Congress is a response to the intolerable acts. Opposition to the British crown had spread beyond Boston and New York to small towns and rural areas. And so the first Continental Congress was designed to coordinate resistance to the intolerable acts you had representatives from 12 colonies. Um, Georgia didn't show. Massachusetts was represented by John Adams and Samuel Adams. Virginia by George Washington, Richard Henry Lee, and Patrick Henry. With the First Continental Congress, they passed something known as the Suffolk Resolves, which is a series of revolution, oh, sorry. the first Continental Congress has to decide what to do about these Suffolk resolves. These are a series of resolutions approved by Massachusetts towns. Essentially they say, look, 
we refuse to obey these new laws and we're not going to pay our taxes until these laws are repealed. Also, we should start preparing for war. They also form a colonial, uh, continental association. We should stop almost all trade with Great Britain in the West Indies, the exception being South Carolina still wants to send rice to their um, to those sugar plantations down in the Caribbean. We should encourage domestic manufacturing and denounce extravagance. It, um, the first Continental Congress authorized local committees of safety to oversee its mandates and take action against the enemies of American liberty. Businessmen who might try and make a profit off the scarcity of goods. So, right, classic economics, supply and demand. If there's less supply and dem demand stays the same, then prices go up. Well, that can mean unscrupulous businessmen might try and make it insanely expensive for people to buy anything. And the committees of safety are designed to put a check on those men. The committees will ultimately be really useful in transferring power from governments backed by Great Britain to local ones. So you start to see the colonies preparing for independence. This idea is floating around more. And the question here is one of virtual and actual representation, because both the crown and the American colonists are talking about representation. But what does that mean to each of them? Well, virtual representation is a political theory that a class of people are represented in a lawmaking body without a direct vote. So uh, let me give you an example of virtual representation, children. Children cannot vote for representatives in Congress. Children can't vote for the governor. Children can't vote for the president. They can't vote for their senator. And yet children are still represented in Congress. Laws are passed to help children, funding for schools, for lunches, for Medicaid. Um, children are not ignored. It's not like, oh, well, there's no kids here, so screw the kids. I can't, they're not going to help me win my reelection. No, no, no. Even though children are not directly represented in Congress, they can't vote. They are, their uh, value, their needs, they're not forgotten by Congress, right? Laws are still passed with children in mind to directly benefit children, even though kids can't vote. So this is an example of virtual representation. Actual representation is when you literally vote for your representative. So Parliament kept saying to the Americans, look, you are representative. Stop saying no taxation without representation. You have representation in Parliament. It's just a virtual representation. But the Americans were like, no, 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 no. We want actual representation. Virtual is not good enough. So is this a legitimate grievance? I mean, think about it. We, of course, like an underdog story, we know how this story ends. We are Americans. We like to be like, yeah, yeah. Like, screw the king. Like, ah, let's do it. Like, we're the best. But like, is this a legitimate grievance? It was a tax on tea. It's not like you had to drink tea. You know, you have to pay taxes when you're part of a country. You are, um, they were benefiting a lot from the British crown. <laughs> it, uh, the Brits, uh, the British army had just defended them against the French. They had invested in infrastructure. Of course, the American colonists are not parliament's number one and only concern because they have an entire empire to run. Or has the British crown been taking advantage of the colonists? What do you think? Is this a legitimate grievance or are the Americans just being whiny? So 
The first Continental Congress did not get us the results that we wanted. We still had the intolerable acts in place. They decided to meet up again in 1775 with the second Continental Congress. Of the two, the second Continental Congress is the more important one. John Hancock is elected as president of this Congress. What does that mean? It meant his job was to preside, president, to preside over this group of representatives, which means he'd be like, call to order, we'll take a vote, I'll take the nays and the yeas. Like he's organizing um, the day to day stuff. So this is extra legal. Like this is not strictly legal. Um, this is not, Parliament has not ordained this in any way. And there's certainly no majority sentiment for independence. No conservatives were elected as representatives. The Second, the Second Continental Congress is much more radical than the first. John Adams, Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry Lee, Patrick Henry, sorry, Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry, George Washington, Ben Franklin, they're all there. Now, Washington can't write very well and he can't speak very well, but he showed up in uniform, right? He is the only one of the bunch who has significant military experience. So we haven't decided that we're having a full on revolution, but we have decided that we need to take more drastic action against the crown. So first off, we need a way to communicate amongst ourselves without the British reading our mail. So they set up their own postal service. Next, we need money. All right. So they will start to print money and then we need an army. With the British troops, um, invading our homes, shutting down Boston Harbor, we need some sort of military force to defend our cities if it comes to that. George Washington is really the only man for the job. Now, there were some doubts. The last time he was in charge of a troop of soldiers, he lost, remember, in the Seven Years' War. But he is the most well-known American military commander. And John Adams is the one who proposes his name because he wants a Southerner leading the troops to increase colonial unity. It's really New England is much more radical than the South. And so Adams is playing the political game here. If he can get the South um, to be in a significant position of power, then that will give them more investment. And then, of course, you have Lexington and Concord. It's known as the shot heard round the world. The British militia marched from Boston to Concord to grab some arms being stockpiled there. Thomas Gage was going to go arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock. The Massachusetts militia sets up to stop them, and a fight breaks out. 49 Americans are dead, 73 British soldiers are dead, and we are officially fighting, right? We have violent conflict. John Dickinson's not ready to give up on peace yet. It's his olive branch petition. This is sort of the last gasp of the conservatives. He sends a letter to the king being like, look, look, man, like this is all one big understanding. Let's talk it out. We are still loyal. I am proud to be an Englishman. I am proud to be part of the British empire. Frankly, he's a little bit worried about anarchy from the lower classes. Elites in Massachusetts and Virginia know they can keep their authority without the British, but that's not a guarantee in every colony. You know, he's essentially saying, look, this is what we've got here is a failure to communicate. We want to prevent further hostilities. We know you understand. Let's have some sort of permanent reconciliation. And George III's reaction to this attempt at peace, no thank you. Now, 
you might be familiar with the musical Hamilton, which admittedly there's a lot of songs that I'm going to recommend, like insert here. But did you know that before Hamilton, there was another musical about the American Revolution? Yes, indeed. It's in this, known as 1776. It's from the 70s. It is primarily silly. Uh, my family loves to watch on the 4th of July. Our options are typically 1776 or Independence Day, you know, like true Americans. Um, and so I would often in my class show a silly song called Sit Down, John, which basically shows how John Adams um, was always pushing, pushing, pushing for independence and the rest of the colonial representatives were like, shut up. If you want a serious interpretation of this event, however, the HBO miniseries John Adams is excellent. You can insert many episodes or scenes from it. There is um, a really excellent scene of John Adams defending the British soldiers during the Boston Massacre. Or I recommend you watch the scene from John Adams um, about the Olive Branch Petition. And then you also will hear John Adams response or um, King George's response. So two scenes from the HBO miniseries, John Adams, Dickinson advocating for the Olive Branch petition and then the King's response to it. The King George's response is essentially, don't care. He never really, he, there's no indication that he reads the Olive Branch petition. Instead, he says, America is in rebellion. He passes the prohibitory law and sends 20,000 troops, Hessians, to the colonies, seize all American ships, hang the traitors. And we're at war. Here's where I would show a song from Hamilton, the classic song by King George, You'll Be Back. So let's stop there for today. We are just getting <laughs> to the good part of the story with the American Revolution. I would like you to explain how British colonial policies regarding North America led to the Revolutionary War. Thank you for listening. If you have found this helpful, please consider leaving a rating or review. Recommend this to your friends, colleagues, your students. If you're a teacher or a student, um, or you're just curious, um, on my YouTube page, there is a whole playlist of videos that I show in class just as supplementary videos to help illustrate a point or a scene from a movie or a show. That is a resource for you there as well. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.